Hello and welcome to another edition of BCBC Diaries. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornital. Happy to be back with you. We've got some tremendous action coming up in the form of BCBC qualifying action next weekend, Saturday at Saratoga. It's the $1,000 four-star Dave challenge. And then on Sunday out at Del Mar, the LRF Cares Contest, 600 to play. BCBC seats on the line in both. To learn more of the details, you can go to naira.com and look up the Four Star Dave uh, specifics. And for Delmar, we've created a little pretty link. That's a really special contest for us because some of the proceeds also go to LRF Cares, which is an aftercare charity. Learn more about that one in the moneypodcast.com slash LRF. A little bit later in the show, I'm going to give you the list of all the BCBC qualifiers from last weekend. We're going to start on the air with one uh, and and one of the younger ones of the year to punch the ticket already in the Monmouth contest from last weekend. Very happy to bring in right now, 27-year-old Dane Kelly. Dane, how are you feeling, man? I'm doing well. How are you? Oh, things are good. Where do you, you look like you're in a hotel room now, but where do you live normally? And where did you play this contest from? So I am normally from Florida. I'm in Stewart, Florida area. So I'm down at Gulfstream a lot and and uh, live down there. And then also I was in Saratoga. My brother, Blake Kelly, is a trainer and uh, was actually supposed to be running in the uh, Saratoga Derby grade one stake race that got canceled that day. Um, so it was a little bittersweet when the day started, but it ended nicely when I won the tournament. So it was a, it was a win-win. So hopefully this Saturday we can get it done with him. And uh, yeah, so we were at Saratoga. That is incredible. What an amazing fact. Have you ever worked in the thoroughbred industry? Any, any time on the backstretch? Yeah, so I, when, I was, when I was young, I used to go muck stalls early in the morning, go to school, shower, go to football practice. So, you know, I, I, I've done my fair share of, you know, walking the horses in the races and, and, and being a part of all that. Um, you know, through my brother and my father, Brett Kelly, who are both trainers, and my, my brother is the one who does it as a full-time job now, and so, um, yeah, I would work with him when he needed help, or I just needed something to do it during the summertime. That's amazing, and did, did you get into playing the horses from a young age as a result of that familial connection? What are your earliest memories of going to the track? So, yeah, so it's funny. I We're three generations in the horse business. My grandfather's name is Nathan Kelly. He was very popular in the Gulfstream Caldwell area. He raced all over the country, but he owned over a 1,000 racehorses, and he was huge in the game. Um, and uh, so then his, my father, his son, Brett Kelly, um, he uh, is pretty much who taught me how to, how to handicap. He, he has the nickname the Turf King because he, he does really well on the turf. So uh, that's something, you know, he's the one who really taught us all. I have uh, three older brothers. I'm the youngest of four, so I'm the, I'm the baby. And, uh, you know, we all we all have to play the horses. You know, I always like to tell people, they say, oh, you go to the track a lot. I said, well, I, I learned how to tie my shoes on an OTV. When I was too little, I used to just sit there and practice tying, tying, tying until I finally got it down. But, uh, you know, there are times, too, when I used to sit there and go, oh, I like to look at, before I knew how to handicap, I'd say, I like to look at that one. Dad, put me five dollars to win. And he'd give me back ten. And thinking back now, the horse was like seven to one. So I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a subsidy. You were yeah, I'm like, you're yeah, on a tear a little bit there. I got I to gotta talk to him about that one. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> There's so many things I want to ask you. Before we get to the specifics of the Monmouth win, I want to ask you about your handicapping approach. What sort of stuff do you look at data-wise? Are you more focused on the horseman side of things? How how do you integrate your knowledge holistically? Yeah, it's funny. A lot of times nowadays, you know, you see, I mean, I use my computer, but you see people using all different types of charts and this. And I'm old school. I use the racing form. That's all I use. Um, you know, I don't even know how to use the rest of that stuff. You'd think I would, I'm younger, but you know, I was, I was taught with the old school newspaper, right? Nowadays I'll use it on my phone. I mean, I'm sorry, my computer. It is nice because you're able to click the replays live and watch, you know, if a horse got in trouble and stuff. So that's definitely helpful. But yeah, man, I just use an old school racing form and a lot of really what I like to do is, you know, we all have kind of a favorite niche or, or thing that happened to a horse. Me is second off the layoff. Second off the layoff to me is just so powerful. 
and being able to to use that conditioning that they get because they're never really ready, you know, coming off a long layoff. And horses, too, that come short is almost an automatic throwout for me. You know, if a horse runs a good race and comes back two weeks later, I, if, if I think he's too good to lose, I just won't play it because I, mm -hmm. I just don't like that that perspective you know sounds like sounds like you might be betting moira in the beverly d next weekend but that's a whole other <laughs> conversation and that answer about using the the form and a starting with the form and a pen i expect that from somebody who's 72 not 27 <laughs> but it goes to show racing takes all kinds let's talk monmouth what were the key races for you on saturday so I'll be honest, I thought that the card for Monmouth and Saratoga were absolutely terrible. And the idea that there were there was bad weather and favorites won, I would say, 80% of the races. And so the mindset I took of it is, hey, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and try to be a rocket scientist and try to beat these favorites that aren't going to lose these races. I'm just going to go all... I have a motto that everybody laughs when I say it's go big or go home, right? I'm betting my horse. If I pick a horse, whether he's two to one or twenty to one, I'm going with him. I ain't doing no protection bets. I'm going big or going home, right? And so what I did is probably I want to say my first five, six bets was I'd go all in to win on the favorite. And so like the first one I did, it was uh I think it was the, the 250, I got back like 420. And then I did it again, and it got me back like 730. And then this was when a pivotal thing happened. So I was betting the horse that ran at Saratoga. I don't recall his name. It was the four horse. He was three to five, and I went all in 530 to win. And I said, he's going to win. I'll pick up, you know, 300 bucks, 350, whatever. And that's that's not bad. And what happened was is my, my brother and dad, who are also very good handicappers, they were there saying they don't think it's the best spot to bet a three to five. And I said, yeah, you know, I would hate to be having enough money in the tournament to make a, a run and it, it go out on a three of five, right? That's just, that, that feels the worst. And so I said, you know what, you're right, I'll just cancel it. Well, the horse ended up winning. So I was like, oh, darn. But that's whenever I, that's when five minutes to post, I don't take a lot of time to study. I need five, ten minutes and I'm picking my horse. But it was five minutes to post to Monmouth. And I said, okay, well, let me look at Monmouth. And that's when I found the seven, Jap Jasper's Pride. And I said, you know, he threw out his last race in the Haskells where he ran, lost by, I think, 25 lengths. I said, let's be honest, he didn't belong in that race. And I said, you look at all of his other performances, the best race of his life, he threw a 74 buyers on the wet. And it started pouring rain a minute before the race went off. And I said, that's got to be a sign. It's got to be Jasper. He's, he's going to go back to his roots. And so that's when I put 200 to win on Jasper. And I believe him went off at 6-1. to one, And I believe he, went, he paid around 14.40. So it, it actually helped me because the fact that I canceled the favorite bet, it came it, it I wouldn't have got the funds in time. So I wouldn't have been able to bet the two hundred to win. So instead of only winning three, four hundred, I ended up profiting like an extra thousand. So it actually was a big a big help in that because that jumped me up to second. And then I was sitting at second for a while and I didn't play a race for I didn't play the rest of Monmouth and I waited till the twelfth race at Sarah uh, I'm sorry, I, I waited till the eleventh race at uh, Saratoga, and I loved the nine, which was uh, uh, Todd Fletcher's horse. He was six to one, and I thought he was going to run really well. And I, I had 1790 in the count. I put 100 to win in place and 90 to show, playing a little more safe in case he ran second or something. And he uh, ran nowhere. He trailed the field. I was super shocked and disappointed. I thought Todd did a perfect train job on it, but it just didn't work out. And then it reloaded, and I went from second to six. And I was like, oh, geez. And so I said, well, hey, guys, I'm going to try to win this thing. I'm not going to mess it. I'm going bare going home. I ain't going to try to mess around with this thing. And uh, that's when I found looked at race seven and uh, uh, St. Benedict's Prep, I, the seven in race seven. And, I'm race sorry, 12. Race 12, number seven. Yeah, race 12, number seven was uh, St. Benedict's Prep. And I thought that Linda Rice did a great job getting the horse ready for the race. He ran three really big races all three in a row, two wins in a second. And she gave him a solid, like, I want to say 37 days off and came back with a strong work of the track. And I th thought there was a lot of speed in the race. And the he showed some past performances where he was sitting second, third, fourth, even fifth. So I said, this horse is going to be sitting third or fourth right off him and make his run. And so at first I told every my dad and brother who were with me that I was going to put 250 across on him. Again, playing a little safe just in case he runs second or something. 
And as I'm making the bet, I said, I go beer, go home. I don't tell him this. I go 500 across, so I go all in, right? And uh, as I'm sitting there, they go, uh, and he's, and so I, my, I have to update my glasses every year and a half. And so I hadn't updated them in a little while. So it's like seeing far is a little hard sometimes. So I went to stand next to the rail at uh, Saratoga. And so I can see that there's an orange guy, like third or fourth, like I thought. And he's coming, and I'm like, I think that's the seven coming to catch the two, who was the favorite. I said, I think he's, I think he's coming. And then all of a sudden, I hear my dad and my brother behind me going, ride the seven, going crazy, crazy. So I said, that's got to be him. And then I see him take the lead, and he opens up by about a length, length and a half. And I did the whole pump, pump, uh, pump fist, and my dad comes running down the stairs. He's going to win. He's going to win. So... It was uh, it was a lot of fun, but um, that was that was the biggest risk I had to take because I just said forget whatever and I went all in, and then the last race came around and we were standing at the paddock studying the horses and I thought the fifteen was beatable. You know, I obviously he was the favorite and should have been. I don't think he should have been two to five. Now, granted, if it would have been a normal day. I don't think he would have been two to five if all the horses, you know, it was like, uh, what, a five or six horse field. So it was a little bit of a messed up situation. But I thought the five, 12, or 14 were horses I thought could beat him. And I said, and I'll be honest, if the 15 runs out of it, no one's going to be able to, no one in the top 10 is going to play with, is going to risk playing without the 15. And so I signed and said, hey, you know what? Catch me if you can. I'm in the lead. And uh, he, the 15 didn't run good that day, and the 14 won. And uh, it, it held. It was funny. We were sitting there. We were pressing the reload button like 10 times, waiting like 10 minutes for it to load. And finally it said uh, updated through race 13, and I was still in the lead. So we started going crazy. So it was – That's awesome. Yeah, it was a lot and of that fun. That decision to not play the last ended up being critical, right? You could have you could have bet yourself out of position. A lot of bad things could have happened. You decided to pass that last race. You got the win. We're running short on time, my friend, but we've been too, having too much fun talking to you. Give me a quick Breeders' Cup memory to share. That's one thing I like to ask all the first-time guests on this show. So in uh, the the Breeders' Cup sprint in 2020, it was Whitmore with Ortiz on. He was the number seven at the time. He was 18 to one. And I told everybody he's going to win, he's going to win, he's going to win. And I put 400 across on him at 18 to one. And he ended up winning by about eight, pulling away from him. And it was funny because the first two links, I thought that was him in the lead. I'm like, is that is that him? And they're like, yeah. So we started all cheering, going crazy. But, uh, no, that was definitely uh, one of my biggest hits and uh, probably definitely my biggest Breer's Cup hit for sure. Great stuff. Appreciate getting to know you a little bit more. We'll be talking because I want to talk to you more about your business and uh, some of the other stuff we have going on at In The Money Media. But a really great getting to, to spend some time with you today. Yeah, no, I really appreciate it. Thank you for everything. As we always do on BCBC Diaries, next up, we're going to check in with one of our regular players, in this case, Justin Mustari. Justin, last we talked to you, you had just punched your ticket for this weekend's Four Star Dave Challenge in one of the Contest Jockey games over at ContestJockey.com. You excited for this weekend? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a good contest. I like the idea that it's not a huge um like entry fee, it is a thousand dollars. I actually won that in contest jockey, but uh, the prize money or the amount you bet with is seven fifty of the thousand. So pretty good value wise. You're not dumping a bunch of money into the prize pool, but they're still giving away a BCBC. Exactly, and you have a chance to uh, to score one in this event. Another cool thing about. All the Naira contests lately, these early draws make it easier for contest players. Have you had a look already? Or are you already formulating plans? No, not yet. I usually, day before, maybe two days, just coming up with um, some horses I like, that type of stuff. But yeah, nothing, nothing yet. Probably wise with weather being a potential factor, etc. One contest, though, where weather should not come into play. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but we'll mention it again. The Little Red Feather Cares Contest. Del Mar races on Sunday. You can play live at Del Mar. You can play on TVG. I love this one. Another one with a lower buy-in, $600, still with the, all the big prizes, including BCBC seats on the line. And you benefit charity while you play, something we're very familiar with from our Horse Players Happy Hour shows. I understand you have a potential uh, conflict on the links, but you're planning on playing. Is that about right? Yep. I think it's going to work out. I'm hoping to be holding the trophy for club champion this year on Sunday. And then 
work my way back home and then and then win the LRF contest. <laughs> positive visualization man it's a thing and i love that you're doing it hey how proud were you of your dad he was our guest last week the great job he did out at del mar running second and getting a bcbc seat were you in touch throughout that whole thing or how closely were you following yeah i followed all day and like he said on the show he did not like a ton of stuff he did not make a ton of bets and i'm sitting at home with some buddies checking the leaderboard every race every two races He's not even making bets. I'm thinking, what the heck is he doing? That's not like him. He likes to play early. He gets his opinions out there, and he likes to make big scores and do that. So I was like, you know, he's going to lose some opportunities if he doesn't make scores. He calls me after the race, says he has 3,500 or so on, on a 7-1 to one shot, and he'll be right in the lead. So it was, it was a good weekend for him for sure. What's been going on with you and your playing? Um, last weekend, um, I played in the Express Bet Contest. Uh, didn't do any good. Wasn't a huge score to win it, just above 3,900, I believe, and made some bets that would have got me there. I had a double live in about halfway through the day for about 37, 3,800 and just missed there. But um, those type of contests I play to try to win or to try to be in contention in the top five with almost every bet I make. So if you hit in one or two of those bets in three or four of the contest, you're going to be in a good opportunity. So that's kind of how I play those in give myself a good chance at a BCBC. No, oh, makes perfect sense. And we'll be following you with great interest. Our other players as well, hopefully going to be getting involved. Tyler uh, on the heels of his nice BCBC score. And then, of course, Jackson's looking to get going too. Hopefully, you know, all three of you are going to qualify throughout the, the course of these shows. What did you think of that? Were you were you following along with uh, with, with, with Tyler the other week in, in his big Monmouth score? I, I know you guys know each other a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I texted him after and congratulated him. Uh, I knew once he once he did make a decent score in that contest. You know that one's different. A lot of people are playing in that contest. It's a big, it's it's a big prize pool in that contest. They give away a ton of entries. So once you make that initial score in that contest, you could potentially lock yourself in because there's a lot of people playing for tenth place, eleventh place, twelfth yes. place, and he was well he was well up there in the top five right away. So it was one of those where hey. Just don't just don't ruin it yourself, and you're going to get yourself a BCVC this weekend. So that was that was awesome for him. Hoping that me and Jackson are next. I love it. We'll be talking soon, my friend. Godspeed this weekend. Thank you. As promised, we want to give props to last weekend's BCBC qualifiers, and we'll do that now, starting with the Monmouth contest. We met Dane Kelly earlier, Sean Nolan, the other player, punching a ticket in there. Then over at horseplayers.com, where you can find feeders and qualifiers just about every day. We had a few of them. Jeff Sandler, Brian Johnson, Matt Letexier, Matt, we had two Matts. Well, the other one goes by Matthew, Matthew Blanchett, and then also Thomas Michael Abenanti, getting a $5,000 partial. That was all over at horseplayers.com. Very excited to see who punches their tickets to the Breeders' Cup Betting Challenge this weekend. We will find out soon enough. That's going to do it for this edition of BCBC Diaries. We encourage you also to follow along with our Horse Players Happy Hour shows the best way financially speaking, to win a BCBC seat because two of them are added to the pot at no cost to players. Thanks again to today's guests and our partners at Breeders' Cup. This is Peter Thomas Fornital from In The Money Media, and I'll see you on the leaderboard.